Welcome to the Rise Network Podcast Show, a podcast dedicated to help you reach your dream lifestyle through investing in real estate. We're going to be sitting down with new, intermediate, and experienced investors to talk all about real estate and how it has changed their lives. If you're looking to scale your portfolio or even just get into real estate investing, you're in the right place. Make sure to tune in. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Rise Real Estate Investing Podcast with Mayu Thaba and Austin. Yay. How's everything going, man? What have you been yeah, up to? I was just about to be like, what's your boy, Mayu Thaba? <laughs> Who the fuck did I get with radio shows? <laughs> uh, things are going good, man. Things are going good. Um, it's been a busy month. Um, but uh, yeah, I completely forgot it's a long weekend this weekend. So this is a, a, a much needed four day vacation, four day break. Other than that, the more mortgage- hold on four days is Monday. Oh yes, for the banks Monday hey, is all. holiday. Bro. Right. It's gonna that's be right. Yep, it'll be all about bookkeeping this weekend. But that is like whatever. But I was giving shit because he's doing some of my booking my corporate account for me. But um, aside from the mortgage business, real estate, uh, I think we talked about last week. Got my non-payment of rent tenant going on there, so I'll probably deal with them in April. I got to really head up to my curriculum, like nine bikes and negotiate some vacancies ASAP. I was supposed to go up there in early March. <laughs> I've just been putting it off uh so much and then my cottage airbnb i got a four star rating from a guest when i fully refunded her first day that cheese me. Oh, i was like me. no i give you yeah, a refund mom. but my hot water tank stopped working and she was being really nice and uh understanding about it and then i gave her the refund thinking okay this will probably stop her stop her from giving me bad review and she still gave me a four star and i was like you little whatever yeah. so other than that um well hold on do you explicitly call out a five star review, like hey, sorry, this couldn't be a five star. Um, this couldn't be a five star stay. Hoping that this makes things better. If I refund you the entire amount, something like get us settled. I, I say something. I, I obviously I said something like that. I was like, you know, really sorry that this negatively impacted your experience. I'm like, we're we're more than happy to refund you for your trip in exchange for X, Y, and Z issues, right? Um, right. But then I talked to Airbnb support. They were saying just because I refund her for the issue doesn't mean that she can't leave me a, That's a review because yeah. the review is meant to reflect her experience. So I was like, all right, let me pay the probability here. Because if I knew I was going to get a four star review, I would have just kept the freaking money. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it might have been a one or two star after that. Yeah, yeah I feel <laughs> like you got it like low key sort of slide it in there without being too explicit with it. Right. Because yeah, some too- people get turned off by that, too. At this point, like we've had so many issues with this like place and it's fully renovated, but now like we, we just replace a water tank into like a reliance water tank. The problem is essentially like technicians, right? So right. You, you can't get an electrician over the weekend. You can't get a plumber. You need an electrician to deal with the water tank issue. And so then I just swapped out to Reliance. I'm like, you know what? Now it's your problem to make sure an electrician comes. And so I called Reliance on Saturday morning. They were supposed to come out Saturday night. They didn't come out. Called them again Sunday. I'm like, yo, gave them some shit. I'm like, I got some tenants here. Like this doesn't make sense. And then they gave me the contractor's number, called the contractor. He didn't answer. He called me back at like 6 p.m. He's like, yo, I was busy today, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, like oh, mother, no. but you, can, you can't even be rude, right? So I was like, yeah. oh, no, I totally understand, man. When do you think you can get out there? And he's like, oh, maybe tomorrow. And then I called him at like Monday at like 2 p.m. And I'm like, hey, man, like just wondering when you're going to go out there. He's like, I already went out. I already, I already swapped it out. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, this is ridiculous now. But whatever. Did he actually though? Yeah, he did. He did because uh, the okay. cleaning checks. But I guess he went in between the cleaner and in between the gas. So no one knew that he went right. in and did this shit. Interesting. Interesting. That's what I've been doing with. What have you been up to? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of the a lot of the same. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> getting through taxes. I mean, the trust. What are the new trust rules where you have to follow the T3? Uh, we're not accountants, so I don't want to speak too deep into it. But it seems like it is going to be a pretty big headache for us uh like pretty much the vast majority of our properties we're going to need to file that that it's going to be a pretty significant expense i mean the quotes we're getting from accountants range anywhere from 400 bucks on the cheap end all the way to like 1100 on the higher end and this is on a per trust basis so if you have multiple properties with multiple jv partners um you're gonna have to file one for each one um, so that that's been a, I don't want to say a source of stress uh, because they are waiving the penalties for it this year, it seems like. But it's been annoying that we have to think through that. Plus the UHT filings as well that we got to work on um, for April. But so UHT, we're fine. 
You see, we've already fought all oh, for 2020. For 2020. Yeah. So we're going to have to do it this Jeez. year. It doesn't take I mean, a whole ton of time, that. but it's just very irritating. Like how much compliance do we need to do? Taxes itself is a pain in the ass, to be honest. So all of this extra stuff is just driving me nuts. Yeah, be, being compliant is a choice, Austin. <laughs> there was a particle that was shared in our uh, in our mastermind group. Uh, one of the accounts that we have in the mastermind group shared an article saying that, like, hey, like most Canadians are just probably not even going to be compliant with this trust. trust yeah. Because most of them are probably unaware of it. A lot of people who are not investors, I bet you they're going to completely green to the fact that they might have to follow it for maybe just one property that they own. It's, it's the potential penalties that to me screams like money grab here. Oh, yeah. Which is like the biggest freaking concern. Like those are like 5% of your fair market value as a potential penalty. Now, what's the likelihood that they actually give you a full 5% like that? Most people would fight that like crazy, right? But uh, even if you end up settling at like 1% or 2%, those are drastic penalties, right? But yeah, Matt, exactly. most people don't know, man. Like I, I've been talking to some of my clients and I'm like, yo, like, I think you guys need to file this shit. Don't take my word for it. Talk to your accountant. But uh, <laughs> pretty sure you need to file this. So yeah, it's yeah. It pretty much if you have a partner in anything and you're both not entitled, maybe talk to your accountant to just verify if that's the case. And even if it's not an investment, like if you're for me and my primary, my fiance is entitled, I'm not entitled. We're going to speak to our accountant because more than likely we might have to follow something for it, even if it's our primary. Um, we will probably be exempt, right? But we still probably have to do some sort of paperwork to show accordingly. But that's been annoying tenant situation. And I think I was meant, I'm trying to remember if I talked about this previous episode, but if not, basically I had a non-paying tenant and uh, we have our hearing. There are so many non-paying tenants. I feel like I'm <laughs> fucking new story all the I time. I think you did. You, you talked about this last time, but let me ask you this. What what percentage of your, because that was, this was completely random, but slightly related to what you were talking about. Right. What percentage of your portfolio do you think turns around every year? Whether it's from non-payment or like just tenants leaving or like whatever, like what percentage do you think it is? I don't know. Uh, let me think. So we have a five plaques about I'm trying to think through the tenants turned over in the first year and a half. Like not from cash for keys. This is like natural. No, no. Yeah, this is not. Yeah. They all got cash for keys. He fully tenanted and three turned over. One of them was unable to afford it anymore, but we're able to get someone else there in there. So there was no vacancy cost. Thank God. The other one was a non-payment. Uh, this was the police constable that I was mentioning earlier. Oh, yeah. They left. I reached back out to them and I let them know. I was like, hey, this is the situation. We have a court hearing for June. Like, can we work something out? And you just, they left without telling me after not paying rent. But after they got that email from me and I laid out, you know, I always talked about yeah. it, but laying out what could eventually happen. They said, look, I'm still willing to work things out with you. But it's a sad situation for sure. I don't think they're lying. Uh, they got divorced and the wife took everything um, They're illegally, right? She just took everything from their joint account. So he's like, dude, like I'm moved back with my parents right now. Dude, um, imagine robbing a cop. <laughs> I know, I cop. know. Yo. And the guy can't do anything as well, right? Like this is like, he has to go through court. <laughs> he still has to go through court. But it's, it's fucking insane, man. So you're saying three out of five, but those are all that market rent. So but this was my, my, like when I was looking at stuff, I was like, probably about like eight to 15%, depending, right? Um, because right. I have like longer, like non paying tenants that I've just left in some properties and I'm perfectly fine with whenever they turn around. And the reason this is relevant is when you're looking at like larger commercial buildings, it's okay. It's like, what, what percentage can you underwrite or can you assume will naturally turn over from non payment of rent or just debt, divorce, moving for a yeah. job? Blah, 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 I think blah. one thing that you can do is you can get like the list of all the tenants and how long they've been there. If all the tenants have been there for five plus years, what are you going to underwrite? The last ten, the newest tenant that moved in was five years ago and no one has left since. So to underwrite anything wouldn't be necessarily prudent, right? But if you see some people come in two years ago and then someone 10 years ago, someone like five years ago, eight years ago, one year ago, it's like, okay, there's some turnaround here. But yeah, yeah I mean, sometimes I've got to look at, I look at, the uh the what do you call it, the pro forma and then i get the analysis on uh, not analysis but information on the tenants like dude they've all been here for at least five years plus so like i can't i got a cash for keys and otherwise i don't think any of them are going to leave like what's going to make a difference when i go in there right yeah yeah no that's fair enough man uh, i mean this is one deal in kitchen it sold for like nine fifty or nine sixty or something for a five unit and it was all like disgustingly like under market rented at a five okay. unit no matter what you do like you can't because it's 
three units or less for like personal possession. Right. Like, not see a camera I'm doing quote unquote red, but yeah. So there's literally like no guaranteed approach there. So I was like trying to think about what the heck I would do here. Like, what do I even underwrite? Maybe I get none of them out, right? And the deal just doesn't make sense. But the moment you get one out, huge, huge lifts, right? So completely random, but. Is there any upside potential? Do you think someone's in there like adding a basement suite or what? what's going on there? Or is it really when you're looking at it, it's the highest and best use is to keep it as is and turn over units? No, I, I think that one, there was development opportunity in the back. Okay. Um, but it's kind of like a weird, like long-term down the road. If you bought out like another lot, could you like develop right. on it? Yes. Do you really want to develop on it in its as is condition? Like probably not, but maybe someone would do it like, Right. Yeah. Again, like the way that we underwrite is obviously by like Good. for me, me even more so than you, I'm way towards the uh, risk adverse side. Right. Yeah. And I would still consider yourself relatively risk adverse too. Right. Because we honestly haven't done a deal for a while, although we've been searching. Is this yeah. either we get outbid or we just way too strict in our criteria? And that sort of sets us back at times. Right. But also, it's not always a bad thing. There was another. We won't touch on it too much. Like we don't like to speak on the drama, but there's another sort of like bankruptcy that came about from like a larger investor in a big, a big group, right? A big group. And that's because they've obviously scaled up aggressively. So, I mean, it's feels like shit a lot of times, but also when we hear news like that, it's like, okay, like our, our portfolio might not be perfect, but I don't feel like I'm stressed. That I'm going to lose everything at, at no point in time. Right. And I, I'm sure it's likewise for you. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. And I think um, not being like balls deep in like real estate, like dependent on the income also helps as well, right? Like, right. Your like housing costs are pretty limited. Mine are pretty limited as well, right? Like, so all that, there's, there's kind of like multiple different factors here, right? Like I'd right. say lifestyle creeps another big part of why people like blow through their funds, right? And I don't think uh, either one of us are necessarily living well beyond our means. Yo, dude, did you yeah. get a new car? Well, it gets like uh, the CRV recently. Did you get a new car? You saw, you saw me in a CRV? Yeah. What? At a uh, mastermind. Oh, no, no. That's my fiance's car, man. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my car is in repair right now. So that will take a while. Shoot. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, fucking the Tesla is take forever, man. Uh, well, you thought. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. You thought times are like, tough, man. You thought I had to sell like, the Tesla. Austin, <laughs> Austin struggling out here. You should probably check in with it. <laughs> oh, this, and yo, I'm so upset you never even asked me. You just assumed that. You probably I mean, wanted it was, to it go. It was a nice CRV. It wasn't like an old riggedy ass CRV. No, dude, I know what you want. To, you, you, you wanted to another group chat and told everyone Austin struggling <laughs> or that he's next. He's next on the backdrop scene list. And his Tesla is gone. Oh, anyways, uh, <laughs> enough joking around from us. We're going to jump into today's podcast. We have our special guest, George L. Massery. You guys might have heard his name around. He's been in the real estate industry for a while. Actually has his own podcast, the Well Off Podcast, which I was recently, I, I did a podcast with him recently. I think you're going to do one next month as well. He is an experienced real estate investor spanning with experience over a decade, starting off with small single family projects, as most of us do, but most recently has jumped into an 11 unit building and also has done, is currently working on a four side-by-side -side townhouse project where he's adding ADUs on each one and then eventually going to convert it over to CMHC, uh, take it over to a CMHC loan. So we get into so many different interesting strategies, how he was able to adapt and grow organically um, through his own portfolio, then eventually take on partners and eventually work on bigger stuff. And then we get into some of the troubles that George faced because some of these properties that he purchased was prior to the rate hike environment. And obviously rate hikes had caught us all off guard. So he had to pivot along the way with some of these bigger projects, but was able to successfully do so. A lot of golden nuggets in this episode. Before we jump in, make sure to leave us a five-star review, comment, share with a friend. I think we have like 130 reviews on Spotify, so we've been pretty flat. Let's try to get that to 150. Um, and without further ado, we'll jump right on in. Just a heads up before we get started, this podcast is all about providing you information, not financial or legal advice. So if you need the real deal for your situation, hit up a professional. We can't promise you our information is always up to date or accurate, and we're not responsible for any investment decisions you make based on it. Markets change, information change, you know the drill. Anyways, thank you for hanging out with us responsibly. Let's jump right on in. Hello, everyone. We are joined with our very special guest, George L. Massery. George, really appreciate you jumping on, man. How's everything going? 
everything's going well. Just, you know, getting the day started. Uh, I got to make sure I get my workout in this morning. It's been kind of hard. Uh, we got a newborn. Um, so, yeah, just adjusting to that. Yes, you working out from home? Um, lately, I've been doing going more like on walks, on the treadmill at the gym, just running a little bit, uh, just working on the cardio. Cool. Yeah. For anyone that doesn't know George, George is a name that's been in uh, the investing community, I'd say, for quite some time. I've definitely heard of you. This is my first time actually meeting you, George, but I think we got a, I think I'm getting any podcast in April or something like that. But uh, he's got a, a quite successful podcast as well, and, and he's quite a successful investor that we're going to kind of touch on some of his projects that he's working on today. But for anyone that might not know you, George, why don't you give everyone a quick background on yourself, uh, what you've been up to, and kind of your origin story. Yeah, sure. Uh, so quick background. I was a student at the University of Toronto a couple of years ago, oh, yeah. over 10 years ago, and I picked up a part time job while I was doing that. So it was for a tech company called Flip, or at least it's Flip today. I don't know mm-hmm. if you guys are familiar with that yeah. app. So I worked with them before they were Flip. They were called Wishabi at that point. And they were just a startup. After I graduated from university, I was offered a full time job with them. Didn't love the job, but I just thought, you know, this is easy. Let's just do that for now couple months later, I get fired because I'm not passionate about the job. I was I felt like this huge relief, this huge weight off my shoulders because I was thinking about quitting for a long time anyway. And then that got me into thinking about what do I want to do next? And that led to getting my real estate license with the intention of investing in real estate because that was always kind of in my part of my plans and, and whatnot. So 2013, I get licensed as a realtor, buy my first property in 2017, do a lot of the work myself. It was an old like 100 year old house, Uh, lots of issues there. I got to do a lot of the work and and learn how to use tools and install flooring and that sort of thing. And then just every year from then, just growing a little bit. And um, we're at the point now where we closed on an 11 unit building in September 2023. And we're working on uh, adding some more units to that building and, and, you know, turning over some units and that sort of thing. Awesome. So, I mean, obviously, uh, earned your stripes throughout that process. I'm, I'm just curious when you were, um, so when you were starting off, there were a couple of years you were active as a realtor. Was that more so? I mean, obviously, you're passionate in it, but was that sort of like how you were accumulating capital to get into your first project in 2017, or why not jump in sooner than later? Yeah, um, I actually really struggled in the beginning as a realtor. Like my first year, I think I only sold one house, and thankfully, I was living with my parents at that point. Didn't have a lot of expenses. Uh, Second year was a little bit better, but I actually used to DJ, uh, do weddings and stuff like that to make some some extra cash to get by because it it was such a struggle for me. So I didn't have a lot of savings in my first like two years or so. By 2017, four years in, I was able to scrape together about 25 grand. And that's the money I used to buy my first property. I also got some help from my dad. He loaned me a little bit of money. So I was able to, to renovate that property and refinance it. That's pretty cool. And I think even going back to your origin story of, of you know, having worked at Flip and getting laid off, like, I think that's something that a lot of us have some sort of like pivotal moment where we just go, something's got to change, right? And that's kind of what what's the highest leading motivation because being a realtor doing one transaction back in 2013 to 2017, right? Like that, that era was not million dollar homes, right? It was, I don't know, $500,000 homes or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. But how, how did you get started as a realtor? Like, obviously, at that age, or what, like 23, 24, something like that, right? Yeah. How do you go about, like, getting your first set of clients? I'm sure we we do have a, a decent amount of realtor clients that, that listen to this podcast and probably wondering the same thing, or people debating it. Yeah, so you're right. Uh, 2013, I was 23 years old. Didn't have a lot of people on my network that were moving at that particular time. So I, I started cold calling, which a lot of people do. I don't necessarily recommend it, but I did a lot of that my first year. The only deal, the only house I sold was from cold calling. And then the second year, I did a lot of door knocking. So I would door knock for three hours a day, four to five times a week. It was like my I was going through shoes like crazy. You know, it was it was hard work, um, but I think I did like maybe four transactions that year, maybe five. So I, I, I could see things were starting to pick up. And then from there, you know, you adjust and eventually became more of a referral style business. So I I worked hard through a program to get more referrals by, you know, doing certain things, by establishing relationships with people and asking people to introduce me to others who are thinking about buying or selling. So that's how I got started. And I kept doing that until probably around 2019 when my wife and I, we agreed, like, I'm just going to focus on investing. She's also a realtor. She'll focus on 
generating deals so that we can put food on the table, basically. That's awesome. Yeah, you, you need both to go hand in hand, right? Because investing is a great wealth builder in terms of uh, cash flow. It's it's debatable. <laughs> it, t- yeah. it takes more money than it gives you in cash flow in the short term. That's for sure. Um, I know we're focusing a little bit on the origin story. We do want to jump into what you're working on today, but I'm just curious. So a lot of people say that on the first project, they put sweat equity and they learn on the job. I mean, mm-hmm. you're buying a hundred year old house where I imagine there's a ton of work that's even out in the scope of what you're comfortable doing. So like, how do you even go about learning or beginning to learn about doing renovations that are quite extensive? Yeah, I honestly didn't have that much knowledge. I didn't know the market that well. It was in Hamilton, which a lot of people have, you know, kind of started there. I just saw it was a good price. I had looked at other markets at that time. I was looking at Orangeville. I had submitted an offer on a semi-detached there, but the pr- I actually couldn't even qualify for that mortgage. So I tied it up and then the mortgage broker said, no, you can't qualify for this. So I'm looking around what price point makes sense. And Hamilton had some opportunities that that fit the bill. So that's why I went there. I walk into this house. There's fleas, there's cockroaches, there's water in the basement. There's all these things, right? And I'm I'm so clueless at that point. I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. I'm like, oh, this seems like a good project, you know, a good price. Let's do it. I can fix all these problems. So, you know, as things are developing, you start realizing maybe I've taken on too much. And but you just have to get through it at that point. You have no other choice. Like the alternative is failing. And that that was never going to be the case. This is, how did you know about like the entire investing side, right? Because like normal people, first property, like my first property was a semi in Ajax that was dated but i wouldn't say like anything compared to the shit that we buy today right Um, and and i feel like today because of social media people know hey it's dilapidated like that's not necessarily like a bad thing right but how did you go about learning about investing did you have like family members or friends that were in the space where did you hear about it was it bigger pockets and and all that kind of stuff or just curious that no so the funny thing is at that point i was starting to like seek out investors because i didn't know anyone that did this right I went on Google and I started thinking, like, how do I connect with investors? There weren't necessarily as many podcasts at that point. So this right. is 2016, probably. But anyway, I type like we buy homes, uh, cash, that sort of thing. And I reach out to about 10 or 15 people, like just cold call people. A lot of people turned me down. Some people were rude to me. But there was this one guy who said, hey, I'll have coffee with you. Let's meet here. I go, I sit down with him. And he explains the Burr strategy to me. And then I had never heard of it. And I'm like, wow, this makes so much sense. And I can absolutely do this. Thank you so much for like, why did you just share all this with me for no reason? Right. And um, yeah, he was just like, I'm still in touch with him today. Um, a lot of you guys probably know him, but it's Sandy McKay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So from that point on, I'm like, this is exactly what I want to do. This is the answer I was looking for. I don't have any family members or anyone that's doing this. I just just did it based on the information I got during that coffee meeting. Awesome. Awesome. And so that first house that you bought, that was a single family house or was that a duplex or? Yeah, it was a uh, legally, it was a single family, but it was being used at one point as an illegal duplex. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just before we move on, where is this property today? Is it, I'm always curious, is that first property still in your portfolio or have you sold on and moved on to bigger things? Yeah, I just sold it a few months ago, and that nice. was to help finance the building that we bought. What were the gains on that property, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so I was purchased it for 215000 in okay. 2017. Yeah. I put a lot of sweat equity in, so, you know, um, it, initially I had put maybe like fifteen grand, but that was purely for materials and then all, yeah. all my labor. And then I had put another maybe around 30K after that, maybe 40, okay. 40K after that. And then sold it for five hundred and thirty thousand. A couple months on a bad return. <laughs> yeah, I, obviously, uh, if the timing was a little better, like at the height of the market, it was probably worth like right. six fifty, six seventy. But you know, I'll take the five thirty. It works. Absolutely. The reality is, if had you sold it at that time, you would have bought a, a little bit more expensive of an asset as well, right? So you buy low, sell low, buy high, sell high. Like it's it's never well, really. Good but thing. also, I could have poured that money into an existing project that we have. Like that's yeah. another case for us right um but you can't get things done exactly as you should or or to maximize the the profit but here's the thing when i refinanced that first property i got a line of credit for about eighty thousand dollars and i bought a second property with that line of credit 
And that was actually an extremely successful investment. And by pure luck, I bought this one bedroom detached bungalow in Hamilton as well for $182,000. Um, I literally just painted it, like the painted the interior and a little bit of the ex exterior. And I sold that place maybe two years later for $403,000. <laughs> the gain on that was way better. <laughs> yeah. But it was just pure luck. So so we know you're doing like a yeah, loving unit now and, and a couple other interesting projects that we're going to dive into, right? But on a high level between more so to give everyone kind of like a timeline or a roadmap is probably the right word here. So you did the single family house in 2017. What were the projects that kind of came after that to lead to a point where you're comfortable to take down the loving unit? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that second property that I bought. And at that point, I think I hired a coach, uh, a real estate investment coach. And he started changing everything. Like everything changed from that point. I started learning about incorporating. I got access to more lines of credits, like more capital. He taught me how to raise capital, everything, right? And and he, then he pushed me like, what? why do you have to keep going after these smaller properties? Why not go after something a little bigger? And I did these um, campaigns, flyer campaigns, yes. targeted campaigns, actually. And I ended up picking up a fiveplex in Welland and a fourplex in St. Catharines within a few months. Um, and then, you know, we did renovations on those, refinanced them as well. So same story. And it just kind of kept building from there. Okay. And the way that to answer the second part of your question, the 11 unit, the only reason that I felt confident enough to do that was that same coach that I had hired. He offers courses from time to time, like once or twice a year. And I took his apartment investing course. And then from there, I just you know, I learned tons. It was worth every single dollar. And that was that gave me the confidence to go after something a little bit bigger. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're taking that next level up, you want to learn from experts. You want to surround yourself with experts, right? And it's even where for people who are just getting started investing, sometimes we see them jump into a coaching program and take action like pretty quickly just because they're, they're motivated and they're financially invested as well. Um, that being said, I mean, I, I kind of don't even want to glaze over what you were doing between now and into the 11 unit, because I mean, four plexes, five plexes, I think that's the stage that a lot of our audiences are still in, right? So mm -hmm. you mentioned that you put out some marketing. How did you target these multifamily properties in your marketing? Because I find that, at least with a lot of wholesalers, including myself, when we're sending out these letters, a lot of the people who call are single family, maybe duplex, maybe triplex, but definitely rarely do you get five, six, four unit owners calling. Yeah, yeah. Well, also a lot of them are under corporations, right? So it's a little bit harder to, right. to directly contact them. I did a bunch of different things. Like I would drive around, um, take note of any properties I saw that I was interested in, write down the address, do a little bit of research. I even in the past, I've had assistance, like do do some digging, some VAs in the Philippines or wherever, find as much information. Because I'm like I said, it's very targeted. So I, I want to know about these specific properties. It might be like 25 to 50 properties. That and much. then I would write them a, a handwritten note to every single one and send it to them and tell them basically like I'm looking to buy call me if you have any interest and I think that handwritten note was really one of the the key factors here because everybody has received those um letters from wholesalers that right. basically you know that will buy your house cash or whatever and I know sometimes people will emulate that handwritten note but you can yeah. kind of tell right you can tell it's printed mm -hmm. um so I, that was the key and then once once i got on the phone with them I, I had a whole procedure just like a wholesaler would and we'd go meet at the property and take it from there awesome perfect yeah that's interesting right because uh we don't see as many wholesale deals on the multi side but it seems like you weren't working from your laptop right you were actually going out there and driving through properties and writing the address down you were doing work that wasn't necessarily glamorous but you have to be boots on the ground to get these sort of deals yeah, at that point, that's that's what I was focusing on, like just finding finding these multis because that was also when the market was on fire. Right. right. So you're talking about around 2019, 2020, multiple offers on everything. They're holding offers. Nobody's just like letting their properties go. People are were holding out, waiting for the price they wanted. So off market was kind of the only way to get a good deal. Not the only way, but it was one of the best ways to get a really good deal on a property. And you're doing cash for keys or these are vacant? No, um, most of them, well, so you would get maybe one vacant unit out of four or five, and then you'd have to work out the rest. 
But that was a huge learning curve for me too, because I had no zero experience with cash for keys, with negotiating with tenants. I had no clue what I was doing. And I ran into a lot of issues on uh, some of these properties, actually. Okay. So so because you were already in the four and five space, like were you essentially scaling with like commercial financing or, or what's the avenue there that you were going on the financing side? Because it sounds like you were going at a loan. Doesn't sound like you had many JV partners. Maybe you were like raising capital, but not JV side, right? Um, so just wondering how you grew your portfolio. Yeah. Um, so, so there was our first JV partnership was on the fourplex in St. Catharines, actually. But um, for the fiveplex, we had gone with RBC because they were the only A lender right. that would finance uh, a five unit under yep. a residential mortgage. But now I'm, I, I actually I'm just about to close on a CMHC uh, commercial mortgage on that same property. So that's that's been a huge blessing because, you know, at this point, we're struggling so much to qualify for residential mortgages. It's so much easier on the commercial side. You get 40-year M, good rates. Right. Like, I'm so happy that uh, this fiveplex actually qualifies for that. So it's been great. It's standard or MLI? Standard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so from there, you kind of just jumping ahead. So obviously, the realtor business has, I'm assuming, grown quite a bit over the last five years, six years, right? Since 2017, when you were doing it full time. What kind of markets are you covering today? What kind of strategies are you seeing working in today's market in those areas? Yeah, well, uh, my wife is mostly the one that's working as a realtor at this point. So she's in Vaughan, Brampton, Toronto. For me, I'm interested more so in working with people that are looking to get into multifamily, commercial multifamily. So 10 plus units and yeah. markets that I work in are the ones that we invest in. So Brantford, Hamilton, and the Niagara region. Okay, gotcha. And uh, obviously, like the, the areas that you're investing in, a lot of people say that the numbers are tough to make work nowadays, right? Mm-hmm. So obviously, you pivoted your strategy. You're not doing these threes, fours, et cetera, et cetera. Because again, like once you refi them, cash flow is pretty much null for the most part. Um, yep. So walk us through how you ended up getting into your first big project that we alluded to earlier and like be as detailed as possible because I think that our audience gets a lot of value from like following that journey along to how you end up getting that deal on a contract, the due diligence, the financing, the mentorship along the way. Yeah, mm-hmm. share, share that entire ride with us. Yeah, so the 11 unit building last year at the beginning of the year, I had an assistant compile a list of real estate agents that have had or currently have apartment buildings for sale. So she put a spreadsheet together, their emails, their numbers. And then I said, okay, reach out to these agents and please ask them if they have any pocket listings. So we sent out a bunch of emails. A couple people have responded to us. Some of the opportunities were overpriced, but there was this one property in Brantford that looked interesting. They were asking 2.2 million for it. It was an 11 unit. So I go, okay, let's let's go take a look. We see it and it looks really nice. You know, they did a good job. It's not dilapidated by any means. It's pretty, pretty nicely taken care of, but it's a little overpriced. So we started negotiating from there. It takes about a month, month and a half to get all the terms worked out. It's a little bit longer on on the well, with apartment buildings, but we agree on 2 million. We agree on a VTB. For 1.3 million at four and a half percent interest for two years. And then it bumps up to six percent interest for the final three years, fully open. So we can refi anytime. We get a second mortgage as well on that. Don't want to interrupt, but like that, I am interrupting though. But just, <laughs> you said negotiating for one month. Yeah. What is that like? What does that negotiation look like for that month period? Because were they just like, yeah, we're looking at, we're going to look talk with other buyers. Um, not just to you. Like, can you share some more details around that? Yeah, to be honest, I don't really remember why it took so long. I think the uh, the biggest thing was the VTB because they didn't really want to do a VTB in the beginning. So we had to negotiate. They wanted a higher rate. So we said we compromised on the four and a half for two years. And then the price. So they went from 2.2 to 2 million. So all of these terms, you know, we we'd go back and forth. We would chat. I don't remember. Oh, and and vacant possession, actually. They had one vacant unit, but we were trying to get a couple more. So we ended up with three vacant units on closing. And then we also had a permit, which was provided by the existing seller 
for a 12th unit. They had an approved building permit for a 12th unit. So all of these things were coming into play. Yeah, I guess that's why it took so long. I think the reality is like, especially when you're dealing with off-market multifamily sellers, it's like, are you really motivated? Might not be. It's one of those things where, hey, like I'd sell it, but like, I don't necessarily need to sell it, right? Especially if you owned it for a really long period of time. So things are just slower to move, it sounds like. You mentioned there, so when you were going through the due diligence process, obviously, you you started off with a, a list of realtors, commercial realtors that had properties on the market, reached out to all of them kind of windowed it down to this property in Bradford, right? Um, and you mentioned it's overvalued. Were you making reference to kind of like a cap rate, like net income-based approach valuation, or was it price per unit, or or how did you go about, like, what was kind of the numbers that you were arriving at versus what they were asking for? Yeah, um, it was definitely the uh, income approach, so net operating income, cap rate, that sort of thing. And this was a relatively new market for me. I had been to Brantford a couple times, like, I've had clients that have bought smaller properties there, but I've never really looked at commercial multifamily there. So I didn't wasn't too familiar with the cap rate. So I had to do a lot of digging on that. But yeah, my my valuation was, if I remember correctly, in the mid 1.9 million, so a million nine fifty somewhere around there. But they were factoring in that 12th unit that they had the permit for. Right. right? So you it's it's kind of it's not exactly super easy to determine the value of that. But yeah, I mean, it obviously factors in. It's probably at least a fifty thousand dollar valuation for for that permit. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where we were at, and they wanted a little bit more. But um, back to your comment about them not being totally motivated, I think in this particular situation, because they had issues with some of the tenants, and I think the owner of the building he wasn't too hands on. He he let the super do a lot of the work there because he had other projects on the go and. I think it was just getting to him and it was it was becoming really stressful for him to have this building. And he just, that, that was the main reason he wanted to let it go. Gotcha. And how did the financing look like for this project, both on the renovation side, down payment, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so I mentioned the 1.3 uh, VTB, 1.3 million. So we had to technically come up with 700 grand. But um, again, I consulted with people who've done this before and they suggested getting a, a private second to um, decrease our down payment. So we ended up putting about um, $425,000 second on it. The rest we financed. I have a partner. We financed that together. The renovations, we didn't have the budget to you know spend a million dollars on this and, and, and do everything to the nines. So we've tried to keep the unit renovations to about $10,000 per unit. And as part of that 12th unit that we were working on, the drawings had an addition. So we were supposed to build an addition. And because there's a big hill behind the property, we were supposed to build a retaining wall as well to to support that and all that. So instead, we've applied for a minor variance to just work within the existing space. It's going to be a small bachelor unit, but that's going to save us a lot of money. So I, I would say our uh, renovation budget is going to be somewhere around two to 250 at this point. And we do have, we are going to build a 13th unit as well. So on okay. the opposite side of the building, there's a, a brick storage room that they're just using, you know, for like whatever lawn maintenance stuff and whatnot. But we had an engineer check it out and we were actually told we can put a second story on that storage unit and turn it into a, like a little loft. Nice. Awesome. That 250 for the renovation budget, how many units is that across? Right. So, so far we've renovated, I think, four units. Um. So yeah, that that's four units, and then we have another one that's that's going to be vacant shortly, and that's also for that twelfth unit. And we we built a laundry room as well. Laundry was supposed to go in that storage unit that I just described that we're going to put a second story on. Instead, we put the laundry in the main hallway to free up the space for that unit. Understood. And uh, I guess what's the game plan here in terms of tenant turnaround? So correct me if I'm wrong. They had three vacants on closing. And yep. one has left and then one is going to leave. Are these through conversations, natural turnover? Do you anticipate that the construction that you do in the basement may lead to more turnover as well? Like, do you have sort of a plan around that? Well, there is no basement, actually, this um, in this particular building. But I, I don't think... Sorry, if not the basement, then I'm at the yep. uh, additional units that you're adding. And my apologies. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to drive... As you guys know, when you're paying you know, 900 or a thousand a month or 750 a month, you're going to go through anything you can go through 
just to stay there, right? Yeah. Um, in a lot of cases. So I don't think the construction is going to necessarily drive certain people away. But yeah, we we had one, the one person that's leaving out of the two, she was in the process of being evicted by the previous owner. I think she was one of the main reasons the owner was stressed out. But um, that process has been delayed over and over. We've we've had our hearing adjourned uh, twice now. So that's one, it's an eviction. The other one was uh, an incentive that we provided to the tenant. And then the other the other couple that we had, we we did provide incentives as well for like there was one situation where there was a father living with his teenage son. And he was uh, I just approached him and I said, hey, have you guys thought about moving? And he said, yeah, like this is kind of a tight space for us. So by providing him this incentive, it allowed him to move into a bigger space to have room for his son. And it was a win win situation. And that's what we try to do when we negotiate. Interesting. So when you were looking at this deal, it says, yeah, you know, it's it's, it's very hard to find multifamilies that have underutilized space that can be converted. In, in today's back, I feel like a lot of uh, uh, multifamily owners have maximized this space as much as possible. And, and so most people are looking at the cash for keys approach. So this is a really good approach on, on your side. But what do you look for in, in terms of making something a good deal? Is it ultimately like pulling out all of your capital, most of your capital, et cetera? What kind of valuation do you need to get to for that to happen? And how many units did you kind of assume you'd be able to turn over? Were you underwriting? Like, there's a lot of questions there. I just realized that. But were you underwriting on the three vacant units that you had been guaranteed almost, right? And that's all you were going to turn over? And, and these two extra ones are kind of like a cherry on top? Or how are you underwriting? Let's, let's talk about that first. Yeah, I was pretty conservative. So I had a five-year plan. I wasn't expecting to turn over a bunch of units right away. But within five years, I think if I remember correctly, we had projected turning over either seven or eight units out of the 11. We've already turned over uh, four, five, five units. So we're doing pretty well. But yeah, I, once once those units had been turned over, I projected the, the valuation of the, the building would be somewhere between 2.7 to 2.8 million. So that's a seven or $800,000 increase from the original purchase price, which should put us in a position to pull out most of our capital, but not all. And I know that uh, that may not sound attractive to some people, but I think the the mindset, like I, I had to shift my mindset as well. I, I did consult with a bunch of people and they said like, when you're in commercial multifamily, don't expect to get every single dollar out. It's a long-term play. It's not the same as a single family or a duplex. So if you have some money left in the deal after five years, then it's not the end of the world. That's just how it works. Yeah, no. and, that, and that makes sense, right? Like the, the multifamily is like more so generational wealth. Every time you do a rent increase every year across the entire building, you're adding tens of thousands of dollars to the yeah. value of the building easily every year. And as rents continue to outpace when people move out, now you're adding maybe 100,000 plus in the value just through, mm-hmm. through one turnover. So it is a different game altogether. My, sorry to interrupt. I know that you, you, you no, wanted to call I, I was just going to say, like, we, we follow the same logic, right? Like a five, if we can get to like a five to 10% net investment of our, of our total invested capital, that's, that's a home run. Like ultimately the simplest way of thinking about this is $2 million purchase price, 250K renovation, 2.25 all in. It's worth 2.7 to 2.8. That's like a 500K lift on one property, right? Uh, so, so when people get beyond like the net investment number, that's when you can kind of realize how, how strong commercial multifamily is. So, uh, you know, really impressive there. Um, I, I didn't come one, one last question on, on the underwriting on this one because you're taking a VTB plus a private second. Um, was the net income of the building sufficient to, to, uh, to carry that debt as it was, right? Or did you have to refinance to, to pay out the private second as soon as possible? Like, I'm just trying to understand. What type of risk you're taking? Because there's always risk, and everyone has a different strategy, right? And and it comes yeah. down to personal finances. But I'm just wondering how you went about it. Yeah, no, it's still cash flows, even with the private second. It's not much, just a little bit. I think a couple hundred bucks a month for the time being. And and this was again, this was with the original numbers. I haven't actually ran them once again to see where we're at now because we have turned over some units. So the cash flow is going to still be positive in this situation while we continue to work. But the only challenge. As you guys, I'm sure, are aware, you can't refinance a property with a private to CMHC directly at this point. They changed their policies. So we're in a position now where we're kind of like we can refinance the building most likely through a conventional loan. However, we're going to be facing 25 year M and a higher rate just to keep it for two years so that we can qualify for a CMHC loan once the term's over. So I'm not sure if I want to do that or if we just keep the VTB in the second because, you know, the numbers look pretty good with that. 
and hope that the policies will change in the future. So we're we're kind of in that situation right now, which I think a lot of investors are facing the same sort of uh, question. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point there. Um, we want to move on to your other project. We have some time to talk about it. So yeah. you mentioned earlier that you had four townhouses that you were looking at adding ADUs on each one. Could you explain that project? And yeah, sort of sort of the same conversation we had with your current 11 plex, but let's sort of mitigate it over on the uh, on the four townhouses. Give us a bit of the background. Yeah. So March 2022, we closed on these four townhomes. It was a private, again, off-market deal through another realtor. We got a 1% VTB, 1% interest only VTB. The reason that I, I kind of pushed for it, uh, like, the financing was so incredible that, you know, I kind of had to go for it, but it was only for one year. And at that point, the rate was in the two, I think the prime was like 2.45%, right? And, and we all know what happened after March, 2022, rates skyrocketed. So within one year, and and by the way, all of these properties were tenanted. And yes. I was feeling pretty confident because I had worked with a paralegal on a couple projects that he'd be able to negotiate with them. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case for three out of the four tenants. They were so adamant about staying that um, they they weren't they weren't budging. One of them did take a cash for keys offer, but we were stuck after a year. We had to refinance. We're looking at over seven percent interest. So now we're bleeding pretty heavily on these projects. But um, we filed an M thirteen for renovations, and. I just had to scramble. I had to figure out what are we going to do? Because I can't just like I have partners on this. They're trusting me to do this. I can't just fail. That's the biggest thing about taking other people's money. Like you, there's a pressure of succeeding and making sure you don't let people down. So the idea here was to go with a duplex conversion to be able to qualify for that N13 renovation because they started to really clamp down on people doing fake renovations to get tenants out. Right. And the cheapest way to do it was to separate the main floor and the upper level rather than going down into the basement. It was going to be more expensive to the basements were unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, so we got all the plans done, everything. The tenants kept fighting all the way up until the hearing date, which happened about a year and a half later. It takes a long time to get oh, wow. an M13, by right. the way, at least in my situation. So yeah. And where was it? In Welland. Welland. And when did you have this hearing? It was pretty recent, it sounds like. or Yeah, the hearing happened... I think in December, 2023, if I remember correctly. Very recent. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 So how did that go? Uh, it went as well as it can go. Like the, the tenants had, they get free legal counsel, right? Uh, as a tenant, you get to consult with a paralegal or a lawyer. I'm not sure which one. And basically because we had the permit, an approved building permit, we had all the drawings, we have the minor variants, we have everything ready to go. Their uh, legal counsel told them like, kind of don't really have a choice here. So. Um, they, they took an incentive from us anyway. And, uh, yeah, that, that was it. They, all the tenants moved. We, we've got a very similar property that we've, uh, we've been debating what to do with it. And I've been on the side of conversion, but cause two townhouses, well, and I'm assuming each townhouse is not, sorry, four townhouses, but I'm assuming each townhouse is not too large in size. After yeah. you convert this, like how much square feet roughly would each unit be? Yeah, they're they're in the ballpark of like four fifty square feet a unit. They're really small. The the townhomes were just about just under a thousand square foot each. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but we do have some nice qualities in in the main floor unit, for example, you have an access to a nice yard and a basement. So you, you have lots of storage. The upper unit's a little bit smaller. But yeah, we're uh we're projecting to get about fifteen hundred for the main floor and then thirteen hundred up for the upper unit. It was a, it's a studio for both. All the units are going to be studios, essentially, They're going to be right? one bedroom, one bedroom, one units. bedroom. Yeah. Okay. Like, like Toronto size micro condo units. They're not, they're not that small, like 450 square feet. I know that seems really small, but I think that's pretty normal. A lot of our units in, in the Niagara region are, are that size. So really, um, Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I lived in a, in a tiny place, that one bedroom Hamilton that I described earlier. That was like 350 square feet and it felt like a lot of space because I had a backyard and I had a basement. So is there parking? Is there laundry? Because I ask all of these things because it is, you know, when you get a tenant that's okay with going in a smaller unit, there needs to be other pros to it. If it has like no parking, no laundry, and it's a small unit, I, my assumption, like these are just assumptions. I would assume that it might cause trouble in finding the right tenant. Yeah. There is separate laundry. 
Okay. The, one of the, the units are in the basement for the main floor tenant. And then we put a stacked laundry up in the upper unit. Okay. And there's tandem parking, which is allowed in Welland. But there's also street parking, right? You're talking about a, a town that's smaller. It's not like Toronto where you have millions of people. You have about 55,000 people in Welland. Uh, street parking shouldn't be an issue there if in case somebody doesn't want to do the pa- tandem parking thing. And, and how much are these rentals costing you? Because this isn't like a normal, like people think do books conversion. It's let's finish up the basement. Let's add mm-hmm. all new electrical, all new plumbing, like stuff, stuff like that, right? How much are these rentals costing you on a, like a, call it a per townhouse basis roughly? Yeah. Um, by the way, it took a lot of work to bring this budget down. So the, the, the it ended up being about 70K all in, including carrying costs and new appliances and like everything, right? Per townhouse. Per townhouse. But did you have to do all four at the same time? No, I'm doing them sequentially because the tenants are leaving at different times and it actually works out really well because that allows us to refi, do one, refi it, have some capital for the next one, that sort of thing. Oh, they're okay. all four separate titles? Yeah. That, that's, wow. that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, because yeah. we're thinking if it's on one title, one lot, then you are sort of at the mercy of the zoning. But because it's four separate titles, you can ADU one, ADU another, ADU another, ADU yeah. another. The one that we have is three towns, one title, one lot. So mm-hmm. it's, we are at the mercy of whatever the city zoning is. But it's a cool strategy to see. Yeah. What what are you doing uh, to make it work? Like, if you merge title on all the all four of these, you could have a nice like CMHC exit potential right. there, right? Like, well, you, you, I just... that's that's the thing. I don't need to merge yeah. to get CMHC. So I've already consulted with a, a mortgage broker because they're all like side by side, all, all basically connected to each other. They will allow you to get a CMHC across all four, even though they have separate titles. But you have different partners on each, no? Yeah. So that's that's the thing. I've had conversations. So I think this is part of the uh, managing expectations thing that I've had to uh, really work on this year. Just letting partners know where we're at, uh, the cash flow, but also that once these projects are complete, we might be looking at a buyout because some of them want out anyway. Some of them want right. to take their money and do something else. So, hey, like when when we do this, we might be in a position to get one mortgage across all four. Maybe you guys can consider a, a buyout at that point. You can take your capital and invest in something different. Right. Um, okay. So that, that makes more sense because we've had similar conversations with some of our clients and uh, like client has this company in a corporation and this company in a corporation plus a small just for the sole purpose of not merging title. And CMHC ends up having a problem with it. We can remove the mom, but then there's a risk that the city might just merge title. I don't think they're doing that as much anymore, but I know a couple of years ago, that was always a risk, right? If they realize same property owners, they might just merge it without asking. And I guess it varies per city, but this is actually well as well, similar to yours. But okay, so, so that, that's interesting. So, you know, you could refinance this personally. You could sell off individual like ADU converted like townhouses if you wanted mm-hmm. to. You could merge uh, or not even merge, but you could um, uh, do a blanket mortgage across the entire portfolio. So what do the overall numbers look like on a project like this? Because March 2022 was um, hot market, peak market, yep. right? So, yep. um, you know, what was like purchase price? What's renovation spend? Um, what are we expecting on ARV? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, we've only completed one so far. Another one's about 50% complete so far, the second one. But um, they were each purchased for 375000 That's pretty good and, price. Yes. Yeah, so, so these are, these were like, Three bedroom townhomes, maybe more like a two plus den on the end units because they kind of have a curved uh, roof or a sloped roof. And then we just had, so I, I mentioned we spent about 70K including carrying costs and everything. And we just had the uh, one property appraised at 505. Wow, gotcha. that's pretty yep. good, especially given that, you know, purchase in the peak market, right? Um, so those are, those are okay. some exciting projects, uh, George. And, and, you know, we've been going for about almost an hour here. So, at this point of the podcast, we just want to ask you kind of two main questions here. Um, the first is like, where do you see your business going to in the next two to three years, right? Because you've done from 2017 to now, it's been quite the, quite the growth, quite the journey, right? So where do you see your business going from here? Cash flow is going to be a main focus in, well, I'd say that's maybe more of like a four or five year plan. But once we get to that point where we want to just replace our income, I think we're going to sell off maybe a smaller property, maybe one or two smaller ones. And dump all that cash into an apartment building, not have like, you know, maximum loan to value 80, 70, 80%, maybe have a lower loan to value, 
and just use the cash flow from that building to fund our lifestyle. So that's that's the game plan uh, for the next couple of years. Solid. And and for anyone that's like a newer or medium sized investor that's kind of listened to this podcast and gone relatively inspired here from your conversation, what kind of advice do you have to share for them? Any lessons learned? Any risks? Anything like that? There's always tons of lessons. There's always so much to learn. There's a, a lot. I think the biggest thing lately that I've learned, and I think Austin, we kind of talked about this as well uh, when you were on on my podcast, but it's the importance of not doing too much to the point where it impacts your life, like the stress yeah. levels, you know, um, it's great that you want to strive for your goals and and accomplish all these things. But at the same time, you have to be very aware of what it's doing to your body, to your, to your mind, to your uh, like mental state. So that's, um, I think that's a priority for me moving forward because I have been under a lot of stress just from these different projects. So I want to make sure that I'm focusing on my health, getting exercise in, like I'm speaking to a nutritionist, doing all these things to take care of myself moving forward. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. I think for a lot of younger investors, we get carried away, right? We jump from project to project to project and we always feel like we have to keep on going until we burn ourselves out or until we get caught offside. But uh, I think now more than ever, I think a learning lesson to your point, like the past year, year and a half with the market turning, Mm -hmm. a lot more people realize how important it is to sort of manage lifestyle with investing, right? It's easy to grow when the market is like going 10, 15% year over year and you can, you want to, but when you get hit with the reality of that market shift at any time, then you you start to understand the full picture. Okay, investing is a long term game. It's not a race. Take your time with it mm-hmm. and, and just manage the stress levels throughout. Um, anyways, George, it was amazing having you on. Definitely got a lot of golden nuggets from it. And I love that we talked a little bit about projects that didn't necessarily go well on surface level, but you were able to pivot and find different exit strategies, taking advantage of the new financing products that are out there, right? I don't think enough people are thinking creatively to figure out how they can get themselves out of tough situations. If people want to connect with you, learn more about your journey, or even check out your podcast, how could the best do so? Yeah, you can check out the Well-Off podcast, which is on all the different platforms. Um, Austin was obviously on there. I've had tons of people on there as well that you may have heard of or that have been on this podcast. And then if you want to connect with me, you can go to welloff.ca. There's a, a link to book a call. I'm happy to work again with anyone that's looking to buy an apartment building in Brantford, Hamilton, Niagara. Uh, more than happy to connect with you and guide you through that process. Awesome. Really appreciate it, Matt. And if you guys enjoyed this podcast, make sure to like it, share it with a friend, leave us a five-star review and comment. It brings great guests like George on our podcast. And until next time, everyone, invest smarter and live better. Take care, all.